Okay, so a big welcome to everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm delighted to have Rachel Weaving, a fellow MGS member, gardener, author with us this evening. We met uh, Rachel in 2019 on the marvelous pre-AGM tour that we did of the island. And I think she was instrumental in getting us into several of the stunning gardens that we saw on that stunning isle. Um, in her own garden, she gave one of the most succinct talks on Mediterranean gardening that I've ever actually heard. It's sort of a 10 golden rules. And I hope that some of that will be in tonight's speech. I mean, we've talked about it. We're obviously also going to be seeing some of the images in her book, Gardens of Corfu, which is not only filled with inspirational photography, photography, sorry, I'm losing my English accent for Italian now, um, but it's filled with advice and very extensive plant lists, which are really, truly very useful. So thank you so much, Rachel, for agreeing to speak to us. It's, it's so nice to have you with us. And um, if you would like now, I'll ask you to share your screen with us and um, we will follow the same format uh, we'll have about 40 minutes of presentation and then there'll be questions all from the chat, which will be handled by Yvonne, very as she normally does, and or you can ask from the gallery and we'll just manage that as it goes through. Thank you, Rachel. Done. You're okay. We can hear you. Sorry. <laughs> I've lost my screen. <laughs> Don't worry, don't worry. The thing, the key is not to panic. <laughs> yes. So, uh, still trying to find my PowerPoint again because now this is doing a full screen and I cannot find it. I'm so sorry. Let me try and escape S from this. Press esque, perhaps. Yes. PowerPoint from beginning. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. I'm so sorry, everybody. You will have concluded that I am not very experienced with Zoom, although Angela's been incredibly patient. She even gave me an orientation beforehand, which um, I obviously failed to internalize. So sorry about that. Anyway, thank you so much for the kind words, Angela, and thanks, everybody, for inviting me. Um, I met several of you in Corfu, so forgive me if you already know that I'm about to say Corfu is not one of the Aegean islands. Uh, it sits off the west coast of Greece, across the Adriatic Sea from the heel of Italy, and it's not an especially large island. It's about 65 kilometers from north to south and about 30 from east to west. But its gardens are rich and varied. They range from old romantic estates and colorful village gardens to stunning contemporary works. Um, as we agreed, I'll talk for about 40 minutes roughly, and I'll touch on how the gardens are shaped by the local climate and environment, how they reflect the island's unusual cosmopolitan history, as well as global contemporary design trends, and how they have certain local stylistic features in common. Um, many of the photos I'll be showing you are by Marianne Macheras, the photographer who um, worked with me on our book, Gardens of Corfu. So my thanks to Marianne, and also let's not forget the garden owners who kindly allowed us to feature their gardens. Corfu has been known as the garden island since the time of Homer. Shipwrecked Odysseus found the king's garden there full of beautiful trees, pears, pomegranates, the most delicious apples. The air is so soft that a new crop ripens before the old has dropped. Indeed, growing conditions are good here with lots of winter rain. And at 1.3 meters, the annual rainfall in Corfu is nearly double that of London. Corfu's summers are completely dry, usually, from May to about mid-September. But at least thus far, they're not usually scorchingly hot. They're a lot milder than on most of mainland Greece. Soils are varied. They're rich and friable at some of the old estates, but they're calciferous and clay at many of the new gardens, and they're often very poor and very stony. And not surprisingly, for an island, we get lots of wind. 
looking at the social influences on oh. gardens. Can and you no, see that? That's it. There it is. The I'm so sorry, everybody. What a bore. Okay. No. <laughs> Go well, to. We remember. We will remember the the introduction. Um, yes, I'm not going to say more on that. But anyway, can you see this one now? Yes, we're fine now. We're we've good. Got, we've got this um, thing. Talking in about the uh, Corfu's culture being. Um, shaped by its colonial past because I think this is something to bear in mind as we see how the gardens have evolved. Um, Corfu was occupied by the Venetians for 500 years starting in the 14th century and they established a system of feudal agriculture on pretty large estates which were producing crops for export. Um, the Venetians were followed briefly by the French and then by the British who ceded the island to independent Greece in the mid 1860s. From all pictures and from the surviving examples, we can see that in the 18th and 19th centuries, local garden makers followed Italian and English models in keeping with the cultural orientation of the aristocratic owners. Uh, today, Corfu's contemporary gardens show international influences in the last 20 years, Corfu has been a magnet for people building second homes. And in our globalized world, not just the owners, but the designers come from quite a wide range of countries. They've established their own versions of a water-wise pan-Mediterranean style. But Corfu is still essentially rural. So alongside the international influences, we also see local ones rooted in farming, and traditional crafts and locally familiar materials. As we look at old and new individual gardens at what might what follows, you'll see some typically Corfu elements. Stone, for example, is everywhere. Um, as in much of the Mediterranean basin, it's the main building material. And it's used equally for terracing. Um, in farming and also in gardens to prevent erosion on the island's steep slopes. And even in quite sophisticated gardens, you'll see um, rocks just inescapably poke up through the soil just where they're most inconvenient, but they're often very picturesque features. Another recurring feature in Corfu Gardens is wrought iron often using patterns based on old Venetian models. Here's a typical Corfu front door um, with its decorative iron grill. And a third feature that's very common and probably in Italy also, is big terracotta urns like these. The old ones call to mind the days when these big urns were used to store olive oil and export it to Venice. Nowadays, many contemporary designers seek out the old urns to use as authentic props. Here's an old one combined with native shrubs in a modern planting. Moving on, we'll look first at some examples of old estate gardens and then at some contemporary works. As you can imagine, I've had to be quite selective, especially as concerns the new gardens. I'll focus on examples that I think are interesting from a design standpoint, but I want to stress that there are loads of others that are beautiful and equally inspiring in all sorts of ways, even though they're not mentioned here. Corfu's historical gardens evoke its, its um, past as, um, as a feudal, feudal agricultural island, basically. Most of the gardens were established at the country homes of the local nobility who drew their living from agriculture. Most of the estates fell into decline after the land reform of the early 20th century. And as the island shifted its economic base to tourism. But nowadays, many of the old homes and gardens have been lovingly restored. None of them is grand at all in the tradition of stately homes of Britain, Italy, or France but each is highly atmospheric. Here are some examples. Crevetsula started life in the 14th century as a fortified Venetian artillery post. 
Then it became the center of a large estate, growing oranges and lemons, vines, and apparently 3,000 olive trees. Uh, when I first visited by the early 2000s, it had fallen almost into ruin. But after restoration, today it's a romantic secluded world with views only open to the sea. It has gardens and orchards and a private golf course where there's a reed lined pond with swans and white geese. The name of the house means little pergola. And in fact, there are multiple pergolas and arcades. And in spring, they're magical with wisteria blossom. But in summer, as you see here, they're lined with colorful pots of annuals. The present owners have restored the house very carefully and redesigned the garden, working with the Athenian firm, Sege Architects, which also has landscape designers on its staff. For the owners, this is essentially a summer home. And Eleni Georgiadis has designed the garden to emphasize summer color. It's a very happy looking garden with bright roses, annuals, gaura, lavender, lemons. And the pool garden that you see here, for all its sophistication and large size, I find very evocative of traditional Greek um, avli gardens. And avli is a courtyard which contains usually a lemon tree and then other fruit trees if it's big enough. And it has a very important feature that it mixes up fruit and vegetables because it's a useful kitchen garden. You see beans and peppers planted among the dahlias. Um, this garden doesn't actually have vegetables growing in it, but it has lots of different fruit trees. And I think it evokes that Greek heritage quite deliberately. And here's an orchard of pomegranates, which is a traditional local symbol of fertility and good luck. Kulura too began life as a fortress. It faces Albania across a narrow part of the Corfu Strait. And it was built in the 16th century by the Cortano family from Venice. It too commanded large plantations of uh, tree crops and vines. And its name means little circle, as you can see from the circular harbor seen here. Um, the garden of the house stretches up the hill behind it and to the side. By the footgate, which comes up from the harbor, you can barely see it, but this is a plant that I found intriguing. It commemorates the kidnapping in 1537 of the seven-year-old daughter of the family by Turkish raiders. And I researched this a bit and a Corfiat historian tells us that because of her beauty and her intelligence, she was educated like a princess and later became part of the harem of Sultan Selim II. Um, history doesn't tell us what she thought about that or whether indeed she was ever able to return to Corfu, but uh, let's hope she didn't have a miserable life. The garden was redesigned in the 1980s by French Moroccan designer, Dominique Bernier. Those planting designs have all been updated since. The layout that he put in place is still here. And on the steep hillside that's beside the house, there are these narrow parallel terraces that run up from the entrance courtyard to a large rectangular pond and a covered walkway that has views of the harbor. The terraces have got aromatic and colorful plantings and um, the herbaceous plants are mixed with fruit trees. There's a lot of loquat and apricots in here, as well as the citrus you can see. And here's a view from above the ornamental pond looking down over the harbor. And from this small courtyard above the house, steps lead to the swimming pool that is on the um, very edge of the sea, but high above it. So it's parallel to the shoreline. And on the steep cliff below the house, people, they planted yuccas to help keep the soil in place. 
San Stefano is another locally famous old property facing across the Corfu Strait, south of Corfu town. It's much reduced in size nowadays, but it too once was the center of a thriving estate with thousands of fruit trees. But its gardens still stretch out on narrow parallel terraces across the hillside, merging into citrus orchards below. The house was built in the early 1780s by another noble Venetian family, and it passed to the current owners, the Manessi family, as a marriage dowry in the 19th century. Uh, it's built in the middle of this almost vertical crag. This is solid original rock. And it can hardly have been easy to build on this rock, but apparently this was a site that promised safety from pirates and marine marauders. And the owner explained that there's still a tunnel that was used for emergencies that goes from under the front entrance. At the back, it overlooks the family church. And around sides of the house, the gardens are much as they've been for decades. They're full of atmosphere and very peaceful. And on the terraces that are level with the house, there are colorful plantings um, complementing the old citrus trees. The last one of the historical gardens I thought I'd show you is at the inland village of Ducades. Some of you might have visited this on the MGS tour, I'm not sure. It belongs to the Theotoki family, who were distinguished for centuries in Corfu, both as wine producers and as politicians. The mansion here was built at the turn of the 20th century by the present owner's grandfather, who served as prime minister of Greece. The house was built on the site of a much older family home, so much of the garden still dates from the 19th century. During World War II, the property was taken over as a troop billet, and it was so badly damaged that it stayed unoccupied for decades afterwards. The garden became badly overgrown, but fortunately its huge original palms and pines survived. And now it, and the house being faithfully restored by Claudia Theotoki. The terrace has commanding views over the village and the valley below. And what I find so memorable about this garden, although it's not terribly large, is the drama between light and shade. Parts of the design are attributed to a woman called Jane Digby. Um, she was a charismatic British aristocrat born in 1807, who scandalized British society with her long series of husbands and lovers. One of her husbands was Count Spiros Theotoki, and she lived here with Count Spiros until the six-year-old son tragically died falling from a balcony. Um, I learned later from a book about her that she found happiness in Syria, eventually, with a Bedouin nobleman who was 20 years her junior. But um, the garden she created mainly survives. If you look in the very back of this picture, you can see a surviving maze from her original days. And George Theotoki, who is now in his 80s, says he well remembers playing in that maze when it was much fuller than it is now, uh, when he was a little boy. Um, this weird looking tree might be of interest to plant enthusiasts. Its multi trunks are coming out of this very much older trunk, which goes from right behind this rocky bank. Um, forgive me if I get the pronunciation wrong. It's a Fetolaca dioica. Um, I understand that this kind of tree was introduced to Europe from Argentina in the late 18th century. And it seems to have become a status symbol among the aristocratic families very quickly. There's still one in the erstwhile Royal Botanical Garden in Athens. And there's another one 
um, outside the palace of St. Michael and St. George in Corfu town. Um, anyway, the wood is very soft and the flowers are quite pretty and white. And uh, I just thought it was a real curiosity. And looking at the canary palms on the right, Corfu, like most of the Mediterranean basin, has had a big problem with palm tree beetles. And we lost hundreds of trees across the island. But the gardeners here at Ducatis are very, very watchful, and they've managed to uh, preserve the palms thus far with a kind of treatment and defense program. Now we'll look at three gardens that in their different ways seem to me a bridge between the old and the new. Each has been influential on designs by other people that have followed. Canonus is part of the Rothschilds estate in the north of Corfu, and I know that Angela remembered this well. The estate as a whole is remarkable for its natural beauty and for its contrast between wild and cultivated and between grandeur and intimacy. The house at Canonus and the garden date from the 1970s, and they're created for the celebrated Greek painter Nikos Gika and his wife, who was the current Lord Rothschild's mother. Gika was influential in the design, and he used a pastiche of traditional Corfiat style uh, for the building. He painted the walls white and the borders of doors and windows dark in a reversal of the traditional island custom. The gardens here are planned to offset the ornateness of the building and the sculptures that are displayed around it. They're mainly evergreen shrubs planted among native cypresses and olives. The courtyards, as one approaches the house, are formal. They're dotted with classical and Renaissance sculpture and other objects and planted with lemons in pots. But in the background, at the top of this picture, I wanted to point out the top of a big plane tree that's being planted in a further courtyard. I mention this because it evokes a much more demotic part of the Greek heritage, if you like. You see big, big plane trees, centuries old, in the courtyards, in the um, central squares of Greek mountain villages. And they were usually planted centuries ago as a source of shade by the communal water fountain or spring. And they create a welcome gathering place. And I think it's probably that tradition that Gika had in mind when he planted this tree outside his home. Gika personally laid out the mosaics in the courtyards. And it's this scene at one side of the Canonas house that it's the reason why I think of this garden as transitional. It reminds us that in Corfu, the brute rock and wild nature are never, never terribly far away. Though it dates from the 1970s, as I said, um, I think it foreshadows today's tendency to contrast the cultivated and elegant with the very wild, creating a shock that heightens the experience of each. And apparently the bare rocks abutting the terrace were exposed by the family members personally. I hope they weren't working in summer. Strongilo is our second tr transitional garden. And this is the other part of the Rothschild estate where there's an immense castle-like house, the so-called tower, whose design was inspired by the fortresses in Corfu town. The tower overlooks the sea, and in this picture, you can see how the pool garden stretches out on the hillside beneath it. This is a, the famous pool here, has been the subject of many magazine articles, and it dates from the mid 90s. Spanish architect Javier Barba, who has designed it, has said that, and I quote, being an admirer of nature, it doesn't feel right to try to compete with it. That's why my designs try to bond with the surroundings instead of standing out. Here, Baba took his inspiration from an old quarry that he found on site. Complementing the pool and offsetting its drama, the planting on the hillside below the tower and around the pool 
was designed by Lord Rothschild's daughter, Beth, working jointly with British designer, Mary Keane. Mary shares Barber's philosophy, and she's written that here, the point of the so-called garden is the place. The planting is all of native Mediterranean shrubs, mainly rosemary, lentisk, arbutus unido, flomis, myrtle, and it's pruned to evoke the shapes of the hills across the sea. As we'll see later, many of the younger designers working in Corfu espoused a similarly naturalistic approach. The third garden that I see as transitional is it at the old inland estate of Gasturi. It's been managed with a highly contemporary approach by its owner, Kali Doxiadis, who many of you might know as a former MGS president. The property celebrates Corfu's estate and garden heritage, but it also embodies new trends in garden design philosophy and water conservation. The estate was established in 18th century, but it subsequently, like many of the others, fell on hard times, and most of the vineyards that provided its livelihood were sold off. But in the 1970s, as Carly will tell you, she visited from her home in Washington and fell in love with it. Um, and over many decades since, um, she has been caring for it. She's now moved on, but um, she was caring for it. And in a very, in a very sort of sympathetic way. And you see wildflower meadows and olive groves merging into wild forests, um, rocks blending with the walls and staircases that she's constructed and cultivating cultivated plants mingling with the wild. And I think in a garden like this, the gardener's aim is less to control nature or to reveal its inherent grandeur the way I think one sees in the Rothschild estate, um, than it is simply to assist nature's abundance. It's um, the idea is to help plants, whether they're wild or cultivated, to be healthy and beautiful and freely express themselves. Kali says, quote, I'm one of those gardeners who allow themselves to be bullied by self sowers. I can seldom find it in me to stop a plant from growing where it wants to grow. She's a champion of water-wise gardening, and she says that in summer, most of the garden survives without water. And the only bits that get water every day in the hot months are the pots and an annual bed. Um, seen here in spring is one of the olive groves. I think the native woodlands and the olive groves come to appear like gardens. And Kali has said, often the landscape here is so beautiful that all you have to do is refrain from betraying it. Mm -hmm. uh, this approach, letting the natural landscape speak with, with subtle en enhancements that make the place more itself, ties in with the contemporary trend in Mediterranean garden design. And like the Rothschild's pool garden, it's had a big influence on younger designers working on the island. And as I mentioned, Kali herself has now moved on from Gasturi and many of us are watching with interest what she is going to do with her current garden. Contemporary garden designers have found that Corfu's natural beauty and its wonderful views make it an ideal place to develop a style based on enhancing rather than replacing what's already there. The contemporary gardens tend to have several features in common. The use of the found landscape in site generated designs, respect for the local spirit of the place, resource conservation, sustainability, water-wise planting, and use of Mediterranean native plants and others with very low water needs, both for their resilience and because they relate well visually to plants outside the garden. Cassiopeia, 
and the following two gardens are by British designer Jenny Gay, created over the past 20, 15, 20 years. On this headland at Cassiopeia, Jenny's introduced native flowering shrubs in groups to look just like naturally occurring coastal plant communities. She says, the design philosophy capitalized on the natural habitats existing on site and these became the framework for the garden. To start this natural looking scene, Jenny regraded what had been steep bare slopes and introduced large quantities of topsoil mixed with compost and added gravel where needed for good drainage. So this is deceptive, it was, it's all been placed by the garden designer. She says her two biggest inspirations are the plantsman Olivier Philippi and the garden designer Dan Pearson. As one might guess, because she has such a deep knowledge of Mediterranean plants and a sophisticated understanding of how to combine them for artistic effect. Her varied plant combinations look to me as natural as wild communities but they're planned for their complementary or contrasting colors and their interplay of textures and shapes. And the groupings actually contain a much more diverse and colorful range of plants than you might actually see naturally growing together. Below the pool terrace, they have a lush meadow and it started just as an area of waist high grassland, but they started cutting it in late spring and in early winter. And gradually quite a rich range of flowering meadow plants emerged. Uh, they find that regularly mowing keeps the aggressive grasses from crowding out the other plants and they leave the flowering plants to seed themselves. And in the, in the summer, it just dries out, but you still have the, um, the surrounding bushes and trees. And there's an incredibly good view of the sea over to our left there. Jenny Gay also collaborated with architect, British architect Dominic Skinner on the rebirth of this hilltop hamlet at Rue. Skinner bought the 200 year old ruined houses here and in 2005 began an authentic restoration of the village, which now has some private owners and the other houses can be rented apparently. He worked with Jenny as the landscape designer. The four hectare site stretches down a steep hillside with old olive trees, patches of native woodland and views over the sea. Working together, Skinner and Gay visualize the very outdoor spaces, um, like stage sets, and they gave careful thought to what you could see from within and um, what you can see from each one and how you enter and exit them. And here's a picture of the locally famous Wisteria Alley, which um, is all down the main street of the original village. Um, various different shades of mauve and blue. It's very beautiful in April. Jenny has said that the plants she chose for Rue had to be, quote, native or quintessentially Mediterranean. They had to fit the character and color of the locality, both climatically and aesthetically. They had to be drought tolerant, but able to withstand winter cold. And some key plants needed to be summer flowering when visitors to Rue would be at their height. And the color choices overall are quite restrained with a lot of year round greens and grays, enhanced by flowers in mauve purple, bright yellow green, and occasionally bright pink cistus and old roses, especially near the houses. The third garden by Jenny Gay is at Agnos House, or another steep hillside garden. It's a very refined garden, very intricately planted. And from this imposing wrought iron entrance gate, steps lead up towards the house, which is on the right. 
past simple block plantings. And at the top of the steps is this beautiful combination of fragrant um, white shrub roses and, and climbing roses uh, with star jasmine on the walls and green and silver leaved shrubs. And when you look at the garden from above, uh, I think we were in the attic of the house here for this view. The garden seems much larger than it is, partly because of its rich and complex plant combinations, but also because of its multiple levels. In the center is where the planting's at its most detailed and the textural contrasts are really engaging, as well as the quite subtle color harmonies which work year round, even when plants are not in flower. And here Jenny's used two very tough and very familiar summer flowering plants. This Gara Lindheimeri, which I apologize, I forget its new name. I still call it Gara. And this is Erigeron Carvinskianus. I think she's used them to great effect, um, creating these delicate frothy textures. And viewed from below, uh, on the edge of the garden, these stepped parallel terraces lead your eye up and out of the cultivated part into the woods beyond. Here's a garden by Greek designer Thomas Doxiadis, and he's used these stepping stones in gravel to suggest a cooling river in a garden that receives almost no summer water. The garden's about one hectare in size and about 10 years old. The owners asked him for a drought resistant garden with quote, native plants and an authentic feel, but to include a section that would evoke the tropical vegetation of Brazil where one of them had spent his childhood years. And Doxiadis and his colleague Dionisio Liveri from his office worked closely with the architect of the house, Thodoris um, Zumbulakis. And I think they were very successful. They achieved this seamless blending of building and garden and outdoor living space. And then on the edges of the garden, it's a seamless integration into the surrounding landscape. And here again is this gravel river in the front of the house. I think it's a very artfully simple rhythmic design. You see the stepping stones in the gravel river playing with these balls of pittosporum and then the rocks and the frothy erigeron on the shore. And then it's somehow anchored by these vertical plantings of pencil cypresses. On the house level, and below it on the Western side, the planting as here is a more Mediterranean. And that on the Eastern side is where we get the more tropical looking um, evocative of Brazil planting. Yeah. Here in the Brazilian bit, yuccas and agaves along with cycads and canary palms, um, none of them are jungle plants and they all have low water needs, but they do help to create a very exotic feel. And here the house seems to grow out of the rock. Um, so you see cycads again and palms and brilliant pink of the oleander. It does for me make it quite tropical and slightly otherworldly, even though it doesn't use much water at all. On the outer edges of the garden, um, the plantings mostly of native shrubs. And Thomas says, we treat all our work as didactic to help people see the importance of the native landscapes and plants, the beauty of the land and our common responsibility to be its good stewards. Here's a coastal garden. Um, this one and the next one were designed by another British designer, Alethea Johns, about 15 years ago. 
And at Lavanda, this secluded entrance, um, there lies the beachfront site. It's very sheltered here, although it's only about 100 meters from the sea. And in this courtyard, yeah, protected from wind, she's used a grid of olive trees. And these some um, row plantings that call to mind the agricultural rows of vines or rows of vegetables. And I think it's very interesting putting these in an ornamental setting. Somehow it subliminally ties in with the agricultural surroundings. Um, around Lavanda, this, this villa, that's not so agricultural anymore, but it certainly is rural. And I, I think this is quite an interesting device to tie a rural garden into its setting. And down below the pool, between the pool and the sea, which is on our left, um, are prune shrubs that to me are very like the ones at Stronghilo and the Rothschild estate. And such pruning is quite popular for practical reasons, not just for aesthetic. And as I mentioned, um, we get high winds pretty much year round. And in the winter, we get lashing rain, which can cause shrubs to break apart. And um, in lavender and rosemary, they quite easily rot if you don't keep them pruned in some sort of resilient shape. Alethea has also restrained the choice of colors in this garden where shape is so important. And the natural light being close to the sea is very, very bright throughout the year. And in summer, in fact, the main source of color comes from the sea. It's very intense and it's always changing. Here's an inland garden by the same designer, Alethea Johns. This again is about 1.3 hectares and it's about 12, 13 years old. It's an example for me par excellence of design based on the so-called found landscape. It's distinctive for the, it's a very strikingly simple choice of plants, mainly based on the plants that were actually growing on the site. And it has these stylized shapes and sculptural forms created from the shrubs that were on site. The owner said, we were keen to leave the atmosphere untouched and we did not want to add plants that you would not find in the surrounding landscape. We use native shrubs and plants that cope with the extremes in weather, the heavy rains in winter and the scorching sun in summer. And here again, um, Alicia Johns has made a very restrained color choice. So we've got mainly green and gray year round with white blossoms from the Gaura and from a lot of use of star jasmine um, and blue by um, Plumbago in summer and Teucrium in winter. And Alethea has kept the trees and shrubs that she found on site, as I mentioned, but by pruning, it's interesting how she's converted them into an intensely atmospheric garden. And she says her main inspiration comes from the landscape itself, but she also acknowledges the um, influence of um, the French designer, Nicole de Vézillon, um, now passed away, whose famous garden at La Louvre has been written up by um, uh, Louisa Jones. Um, Alicia says that the success of a design like this one at Belherbe depends crucially on good garden maintenance. Nature provides the material, but it's the hand of the gardener that shapes it into art and indeed keeps it that way. Here's a last example from Alicia Johns, this time at Villa Villa Nidi, of using the found landscape. She uh, took the wild trees that she found on site and just pruned them very selectively to create atmosphere and structure and then laid the pool to be parallel with them. Here's almost our final garden, one designed by its owner, British sculptor Catherine Wise. 
Catherine and her husband created this garden in 2008 when they restored a ruined olive press that's now their home in northern Corfu. She's placed the vertical spires of a sculpture, Towers of Time, to be reflected in its own pool, which flows into the infinity pool. And in her planting design, Catherine, quote, sought color, sorry, subtlety in color hues, variety in form and texture to complement the many sculptures that she put on display. And then here's quite a humorous little scene. Um, strong shapes like these, complemented by the architectural plants, such as the palm and yucca and agave, um, really make these objects that she salvaged from the old olive press acquire the qualities of art. I think this is a really fun little scene. Here is our last example from a contemporary garden. I think this strikingly simple design really makes the most of the spirit of place. It's Villa Principessa in Southern Corfu, and it's by an Israeli designer, <clears throat> Haim Cohen. And he created the infinity pool with this curved edge and a dark lining to accommodate the original old olive tree that's growing on the slope below. And he's pruned the tree to become an essential part of the design, echoing the shapes of the islands across the sea. If you could just see them, it's not such a brilliant image. I think I took this one, but you get the idea, I hope. Okay, so we've come to the end of our tour. And in closing, I thought I'd mention that after a COVID gap, we're planning to resume a twice yearly event, Corfu Open Gardens Weekends, in which private gardens across the island open to the public for a weekend in May and a weekend in October. Um, this began a few years ago and it quickly got very popular with locals and visitors. Um, not all the gardens that we've just been looking at participate in this. Some of them are way too private, but there are lots of others that make up for their lack. And lots of owners who are really interested to talk to visitors about their experiences. So I found it a completely delightful event. There will be a new Facebook page called Corfu Open Gardens opening up soon to give more information. And I'll give Angela the email address of the new organizer for any of you who might like to be in touch about it. So yes. thank you so much for listening and please feel free to ask any questions. Thank you, Rachel, stunning. Absolutely, what, what, was, what, what was needed on a rainy afternoon in Rome, um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so uh, <I'll, laughs> um, let's see what's on the chat. If you'd like to un unmute yourselves, I'm going to put everybody now on, here we all are. Um, and you can either speak out, it's like always slightly haphazard, or we can see if anybody's written something on the chat, Yvonne. Rachel, um, can, I, can I ask a question? Sorry. Yes, of course. Yes. Um, what, have the local nurseries responded to this new wave of enthusiasm for gardening? And we've got Philippi here in, in France, of course, but, but have you got that, that sort of or, or range of, of nursery available to you? That's the short answer. It's very disappointing. Um, but you know, this is, a, this is partly a result of it being a small island. And um, the local nursery owners get most of their revenue from the really safe stuff. Um, and in, among most of them, you'll still find the idea that the safe stuff is petunias and it's bedding plants coming from Holland or from Athens. Um, one or two now are beginning to be a lot more adventurous, but still many people with interest in gardens, depending on native plants, yeah. have to get the plants from Athens. Um, Jenny Gay gets a lot of plants ordered in from Philippi. 
Kalidoxiadis um, has ordered irises from France. I have ordered shrubs from various places. And of course, you wait with your bated breath to see whether the courier is going to find you before everything yeah. shrivels in its box. Yeah. Um, but no, it, this is a, a real problem that you've put your finger on, especially for people designing and introducing gardens on a relatively small scale who cannot get a big designer who deals in volume, um, who can bring a whole container of plants sure. from another place. Mm. Thank you. Okay, so Susan's asking, when are we going on a Corfu tour? <laughs> <laughs> you all are welcome again when we when we're going again <laughs> is that, is that mgs italy or mgs whatever <laughs> now we, we also had a question came in before the talk from liz godfrey and uh she she was saying that the uh her understanding is that the water table on corfu is being um drawn down uh, as a result of the amount of watering that's going on and the abstraction of, of the um, from the aquifers. Um, so she's wondering what attempts are being made in Corfu to store um, rainwater in a sustainable way um, you know, during the winter when you get this tremendous um, uh, rainfall. And you know, do you see people moving towards recycling of water or using grey water, anything like that. Uh, Liz makes this observation because she's gardened on Paxos um, nearby. And that's what uh, they have to do there when, when there's no mains water. Um, um, are you seeing a, a move towards conservation? Uh, we definitely are among people who are building and owning new houses. I mean, they're they are continuing the old village tradition of having a big tank underneath your terrace in, in which you store rainwater. Uh, some of these tanks are huge and people at their properties collect water from all the sources that they can find during the winter. Um, a number of houses are using grey water and introducing a composting system even for sewage. Um, some of the houses that Alethea Johns has designed gardens for have such systems. And it's extraordinary how using sewage sludge, which doesn't seem to smell, um, makes the plants pretty green and vigorous. Um, so there is quite a, quite a big effort to use grey water um, as well as to store rainwater. Um, but you're absolutely right. The water table is being drawn down and water is from the uh, municipal supply is not really usable in the summer in many parts of the island because it's too saline. Um, and, um, yeah. you know, it's just sucking in water from the sea. And mm. also, if it's even not sucking water from the sea, it's too heavy in minerals. And so it burns mm. the plants. Is it, um, it's Liz, this is Liz speaking actually. And I, I'm really pleased to hear that because uh, I'd heard about this and I was really disappointed because for years and years we'd sort of had a big sterner under the terrace. I mean, it's a tiny house in the middle of an olive grove, but um, that's then that's what we did. We saved the rainwater, which we used anyway in the house, and mm -hmm. all our wash, all our washing and bath water and everything else went into buckets under the sink, and we used that. For yes, water. you know, I mean, it's uh, very basic, but it worked. Yes, I use all my bath water on the plants. <laughs> We've all but forgotten how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> the real problem is swimming pools, though. Mm -hmm. And um, also the fact that in Corfu, so much, um, so many of the big houses are rented. Um, they're an economic resource. They're not just second homes. And many of the renters are large families or large groups and it's not uncommon for members of the renting community to take three or four showers a day whenever they go in to the swimming pool they take another shower etc and there's not really anything one can do about that i fear but um um 
it's much less the gardeners, I think, than the renters who are the main consumers of water, but certainly it's a problem. Hmm. I wanted to ask, if I may, uh, when you said that your, when your summers are relatively uh, my, um, not too hot, what's your sort of, I know things are very random now with patterns and so on, but what would you, what would be the top temperature that you would be dealing with there? In an average mm, summer? Yes, at an average summer, I would say 30, 32, something like that. Uh, we've had peaks, including a rather nasty heat wave um, this past summer, um, where it stays above that for a while. But typically, it's um, 30, 32, I would say. Does anybody else, Corfu resident, like to chime in on that? Don't all speak at once. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that, I'm not, do we, I don't know. Is there, is there anyone from Corfu other than Rachel? I don't think. Helen is, is living I'm in from Corfu. I'm from Corfu. Oh, okay. Oh, hi, Tom. Yes, what would you say about the summer temperatures? Well, it was uh, extraordinary this summer, but uh, mm. it's, it, even the borehole water is salient as well, so we have to purify it. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, mm. Uh, as you know, Rachel, we've got a, a lithia did our garden as well. And yes. it was an enormous amount of water. Um, and the only way to do it is a borehole, really. There's a lot of work being done on sustainable energy and other things as well. So it's, uh, where it's quite difficult because it's such a small place. And so you've got to go to Athens for the advice and everything else. Mm -hmm. So Rosie, are you have you moved there then, please? Rosie and Christina, hello. Hi, hello. Hi. Hello. So are you there? Are you there? Yes, yeah. Oh. We are on Corfu. Yep. Oh wow. I we moved here early August. Um, we're managing an estate here. Oh, okay. Developing gardens. So. Hmm. Excellent, beautiful place. It is indeed, yeah, it's great. Great. Okay, oh, somebody else is in Corfu, Daria. Daria, Daria is in Corfu, <laughs> hi Daria. Hello. Hi, can you hear oh. me? Daria has restored a beautiful garden at the Capodistrius Museum. And that is actually part of the open gardens, has been part of the open gardens weekends. I'm and in Corfu an also, and I just, I'm in Corfu also, and we've just, um, been, we worked with Alethea during the lockdown from New Zealand. It was quite challenging doing it all remotely, but um, uh, she designed a beautiful garden for us and it's just, uh, the installation's just been completed this fall and uh, it's very exciting. It's still a work in progress. And uh, we're looking to integrate it down into the olive grove below us. And we discovered we own a huge cistern that hasn't been used for years. So we're going to start to figure out how to get the rainwater into it and begin to use that for the garden. Great. Mm -hmm. So quite a few from, from the size of the island, there aren't quite a few of you here. And Dari, are you a, a designer? No. <laughs> oh, <gosh>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a curator. Um, <laughs> um, but oh, yeah, I'm it's very it's lucky, as Rachel said, that. I'm oh, sorry. Sorry. I was saying Daria is the director of the Capodistrius Museum, which is the <laughs> national treasure. I'm going to mute myself so you can hear her better. <laughs> Well, we we had a good meet. We had a good visit there. Yeah, and the Capodistria Museum. Yes, yes, we had a lovely time together. And um, as as you all know, as Rachel knows very well, we are we are trying to restore the garden um, uh, because it was um, it was abandoned for almost forty years, and um, and uh, nature really took over. <laughs> 
and um, and we are continually trying to, uh, to study it and uh, fundraise mm -hmm. in order to be able to make it accessible like in visitors um, it, it, it's, it's the whole the whole thing and um, slowly but steadily I hope we're going to manage it now we are preparing some um, sign post uh, a signage so somebody that can visits the museum can actually follow on their own a route on the uh, in the garden and you know, find um, information about how what kind of cultivations it used to have what kind of plants it used to have what 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 did it mean for um local nobility in the 19th century uh Uh, to have because uh, and, and the existence of the villages around the estates is also quite important because it it, it kept uh, it kept th this kind of estates kept an economy going and and communities were growing around them and uh, now that the economy has changed we kind of seem to have lost the link and hopefully we are going to make it more. Um, we're, we're going to start by narrating it and let's see what 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 more information we can uh, make available in different ways in the future. Thank you. Okay, very interesting. A big job, a challenge. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so were there any other questions, Yvonne, this evening? Let me, you just checking on the... Um, uh, Rosie was just asking, could we repeat the name of the museum, please, Dario? Was it Capodistria? Yes, it was Capodistria's museum. Um, you can find us online. It's spelled with a C. C-A-P-O-D-I-S-T-R-I-A-S. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and another question that I don't think we quite... God, we, we, we understood about the temperatures in summer, but what about the temperatures in winter? How cold does it get? Are you asking me? No. Or anyone, not, really. Or anybody <laughs> from who's living there, yeah. But maybe Rachel, <laughs> since oh. you're the... Yes. Um, so I, I would say it, it almost never freezes. It's very rare if we get snow at coast level. <laughs> oh, although no, no. In the high country, it can be snowy, but snow doesn't typically stay on the ground. And uh, it is usually, I, know, I would say no lower than about five, seven degrees during, during the night. But um, oh. Daria, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I tend to think in Fahrenheit for winter temperatures. So I was going to say 40 to 45 would be the chilliest days um, but I would appreciate somebody else's input no. I think I think you're you're more or less right I think it doesn't go below zero easily yeah I want to say something I don't know how to say it. Sue uh, is that Sue yes yeah, I, want to, Sue? I, um, I want to say that we have a house in Corfu and we quite regularly get snow in the winter and I've known days when it's minus five for, for about a week a week going hmm? Um, I How high like, are you? Um, well, I'm not sure. We live at, at the village of Lutzes. So it's on the way up to um, Perithia, Old Perithia. That is high. That's uh, What would that be? At least 500 metres. I think a bit lower than that, but about 300 probably, I think. 300, so, yeah. yes. Okay. It's so, quite a regular think... occurrence um, to get those. But I'd just like to comment on the use of sternas, because when we first went there, uh, we had to have a sterna of 80 cubic metres, which was into our entire water supply for the house, but it's amazing how quickly a Estella can carry, uh, fill up from a really very small roof area. I, I agree. I agree with that. I mean, for, for even now, um, uh, I, it's my stepdaughter's house now. But even now, they live on on their just their rainwater. Really, they, yeah. they hardly use their mains water at all because it's not very good. Yes, so, yes absolutely. So. So that's but, but too, does it not tend to be full at the wrong time of year? <laughs> well, you just have to unhook. <laughs> you, want, you go around and unhook the pipes. 
the, the, there are always occasional rainstorms that tend to keep it going more or less so uh, we've I mean, never we, had frost damage but we have at 300 feet had snow but once in 20 years yeah but i've never so, seen we've, frost we've damage. had about sort of every three to four years we have snow okay. in winter but I mean, often it isn't the snow. I think that snow no, it's, itself is not a problem. Yeah. It's when it yeah. then it melts and then freezes at night, and that's where I think, in my experience, mm -hmm. damage tends to come. And I would say in recent summers we've been having much hotter temperatures. We get thirty-eight to forty sometimes yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. it's, it's been noticeable that, that recently that there have been hotter summers. Hmm. It's been a very interesting talk. Rachel, yeah. what date is the May tour? <laughs> what date is the May tour? Hmm. Did, did you say? I think probably around the 12th of May. Um, it'll probably be, you know, I haven't looked at the dates, what is what falls on a Saturday and Sunday, but probably around the 12th would make sense. Um, uh, how can we register? Um, I think we need to wait until the Open Gardens Facebook page comes up. Um, the person that's organizing this is working on it at the moment. And you don't need to register in advance at all. You just need to be informed about which gardens are open and then you just show up. Um, but there will be more information on the Facebook page. Um, and then, as I said, I'll give Angela the, um, the address okay. of the new organiser, uh, whose name is Annie Lawton. She's an English woman who lives year round in Corfu. OK, so what um, I'll do when I get it, OK, um, mm -hmm. I'll just write to everybody. So then you've just Thank that's you. done. Yes, please, Thank please Angela. So We're interested yes. to go in May, perhaps, but oh, yeah. yes. we, will not, we need some information. OK, let's and do it. Not, it's not, it's Keep to that. I'll meet it's you not there. very far from us. <laughs> Good. The so, other so thing I just is... add one thing. You, mm -hmm. thank, I loved your book, but thank you so much for mentioning the gardeners' names because you so rarely see that in all the books about gardeners and, and fairly frequently you mention their names, which is lovely. So mm -hmm. thank you. Good. Thank you. Well, it's all because of them. <laughs> Wouldn't mm -hmm. exist otherwise. Mm. May I ask a question, please, to, to, to Rachel? Uh, I just wanted, I didn't catch the name of the plant, uh, which was close to, uh, to the swimming pool, very well pruned. Um, uh, perhaps it was in, uh, in uh, Kulura, or yeah. I don't rosemary. remember the name. Rosemary. Was was it was it a very big pool with the very it was very low pool? low and close no, I, in the most, edge. Mm -hmm. Sorry, most most probably it was the um, the um, uh, trailing rosemary. Um, the rosmarinus, I think, is it procumbens? I mean, it's the one that um, naturally creeps rather than is naturally upright. Uh, the rosemary. The rosemary. Yes. Okay. Uh, but you also see Arbutus unido pruned very, very closely, and Pistachia lentiscus mm -hmm. that adapts very well to pruning and it's very commonly yeah. used. And Motus communis, the um, yes, myrtle. Motus. Thank and you. I think what we saw was the was the rosemary. Yeah, because it was interesting. The day we were there, the gardeners were there, and. Mm -hmm. um, that is a saltwater pool, and the rosemary does not enjoy that pool. So, I mean, it's it's a stunning design, and it obviously yeah. survives because it 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 does survive. But that was their comment. I think Willem Jan is here as well. He was with me when we were talking to them, and so there's a little bit of because of course when kids jump in, that yeah. it, it <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. so with us. <laughs> Plus, it's a coastal site, and in the winter, you get lots of salt spray from the sea. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. But on Even the other I mean, rosemary is a toffee. I mean, you know, so anyway, so that was just a little byline. little interesting um, anecdote. Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, look, I'm going to 
draw to a close if nobody else would like to add anything further other than our thanks obviously to Rachel for 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 a lovely talk um fantastically uh, inspiring um we will be beating a trail to either Boxwood or to to Corfu <laughs> to get to get to see those gardens again thank you so much thank you, thank you very thank much you so much thank you. thank you for having me Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right. See you next month. Thank you. See you next month. Yeah. Take care. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.